today, today's presentation is the wireless architect at Cisco designated VIP alumni, George Stefanik. George is an uh, engineer experience spans nearly two decades, and he's going to actually spend a few minutes introducing himself in more detail. We also have two question managers. Uh, first, we have uh, Carlos Alcantara, who is a consulting system engineer at Cisco, and he uh, is on the South Network Transformation team at Cisco and is responsible for delivering scalable designs that enable mobility solutions across many verticals uh, at Cisco. He is a CCIE in routing and switching and wireless, and he also holds a CWNE certification. Uh, we also have a Cisco customer support engineer, Edgar Monroy, and he's an expert in the wireless LAN communications, uh, and his focus is on Cisco appliances. So thank you, Carlos and Edgar, for joining us today. Thank you, Monica. After the event, and from now until, until February 24th, uh, George will be there to answer any technical questions that you may have about this topic uh, on this as the expert event, and you can join that in the community. If you have any technical questions after the event re regarding this topic, feel free to ask them in there, and George uh, very nicely agreed to answer those questions uh, until the 24th of uh, February, so uh, take advantage of that. If you would like to get a copy of the presentation, uh, it is in the chat you will see the link to the PDF version of these, uh, the slides, so you will be able to follow through. So you can bookmark that and, and then follow through the slides. And then this is an interactive event. You will be able to ask your, your technical questions using the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand side of the corner. And uh, once we finish with the presentation, we will be uh, reading some of the technical questions to George Stefanik, and he will be answering them verbally. Some of those questions will also be answered by Carlos and Edgar throughout. And now, let me just pass on the mic to, to George for him to start the presentation. Thank you, Monica. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're uh, attending the session. Uh, before I get started, I want to send a, a special thanks to Monica and Hilda for putting together this event. I can tell you it's no easy task. Um, there's a lot of scheduling and PowerPoints that are going back and forth and the marketing engine behind it. I'm very appreciative to have this opportunity. And also, I want to spend, uh, send a special thanks to Edgar and Carlos. Um, if any of the attendees have questions midstream throughout the presentation, feel free to ask them. Uh, Carlos and Edgar will do their best to keep up. And uh, a special thanks to Carlos. Carlos is actually our CSE um, here at Houston Methodist. Um, not only is he a, a double CCIE, uh, but a very knowledgeable guy. Um, and, and a lot of our success here at Methodist I can say bringing Carlos into our team um, has allowed us to be very successful. So very thankful to have Carlos uh, and his time on this. So a uh, little bit about myself. I'm George Stefanik. I'm a wireless architect for Houston Methodist Hospital System. And uh, in this session, I'm going to be sharing with you what I call the good, the bad, and the ugly in deploying an all-wireless office. And, and my goal here is to share with the attendees lessons learned. Um, in fact, uh, this May will be our three-year anniversary um, in deploying the all-wireless office. So a little bit about myself. I hold vendor and vendor neutral certifications. Um, I blog at Anaruba Airheads, Mito211, and the Cisco support forums, and you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm also a, a senior trainer at wifitraining.com, and uh, I hold various VIP and MVP um, status. Um, and you can see with some of the pictures there, um, Wi-Fi has really taken me around the world more than just doing healthcare. Um, you know, in Peru and Chile, um, recently in Trinidad. Um, so uh, it's a lot of a good experience from uh, indoor, outdoor, putting it all together to come up with solutions for reliable Wi-Fi. Uh, part of Wi-Fi training, Wi-Fi training is a Cisco learning partner. Um, and you might see some familiar faces up on this line here, uh, Chris and Rizika, um, heavily both involved in uh, the Cisco support forums and the learning network. Um, really proud to be working with those guys. So uh, a little bit about our architecture here at Houston Methodist to kind of set the, uh, the scope of how large we are. 
Um, we currently have 11 wireless distributions. 14 of those are WISM 2s. We have four 5508s and two 8504s. Um, we're currently going through an upgrade and updating the WISM 2s to 5520s. Um, we have uh, two 5508s for Office Extends. We have a rather large Office Extends network. Um, we also have two 5520s serving as our guest anchors. Um, at last count, we have almost 7,000 access points. We have 25,000 concurrent wireless clients, uh, of which we have about 50,000 daily connects. So that means 50,000 unique devices um, get on our network in a 24-hour period. Um, of that client mix, we have approximately 2,000 voice devices. These include the 7925s and the Vicera badges. Um, we recently are deploying, um, as of two weeks ago, the new 8821s. As I mentioned, we do Office Extends. We have the prime infrastructure. We pretty much have the catalog from Cisco, right? Uh, the Cisco IS MSE. Um, our, location, our design is a location grade. Um, so we, we uh, look at second and third AP coverage um, when we do all of our designs. Now, for any folks that uh, are attending the session that are in healthcare, um, a lot of these devices are going to look familiar to you. Um, your struggles are my struggles. Um, and if I had to put all of the devices that we manage on a Wi-Fi network in healthcare, I, I'd be many more slides in and probably a much finer print. Um, but these are the, the biggest devices um, that come out, um, uh, you know, laptops, tablets, cardiac imaging, you know, computers on wheels, um, the Vicera badges, infusion pumps. We even have mobile robots, believe it or not, crest on units. Um, we have uh, wireless door locks. Um, we have work group bridges on a lot of our devices, uh, Roche diagnostics. Um, so a lot of devices are on our Wi-Fi network. <clears throat> and you know what's really interesting about this slide is that like I mentioned we can go slides in, and, and part of reliability is not just installing a Wi-Fi network and getting a mental checkbox that it works. It's actually analyzing each one of these devices. And uh, I can honestly tell you I'm, I'm rather unique for many systems in that we actually have a Wi-Fi team that's dedicated to Wi-Fi. Um, a lot of folks are routing and switching and know they do Wi-Fi too. Um, you know, we've come to a, a certain mass where, you know, we needed to have dedicated engineers just focusing on Wi-Fi. And uh, we're really blessed to have that opportunity. And, and I hope in this session I'm going to share with you some of the testing that we've done with devices and, and the importance of, of the client on the network. So in prepping for this, I wanted to share with you an updated slide. This slide is actually from January 2015 to 2016. I wanted to put the updated slide in there. I had some issues. I wasn't able to get it in in time. But what's interesting about this slide, and this slide has a story to tell, um, and it's not unique just to us. It's This is happening on a lot of infrastructures today. Um, the daily connect of clients connecting to our network has increased over 5,000 devices in 12 months. That means from January to December um, of last year, um, we have 5,000 more clients on our network on a daily basis than we did the year previously. So that, that's a rather unique number. This is not unique to Methodist, obviously. Um, I'm sure many of your infrastructures are, are seeing the same incline. Um, Wi-Fi is not a fad. It's not going away, right? So this is a very important slide, and the reason why it has a story to tell is because we have to design very robust networks because the clients are coming. And I think we're going to see this increase dramatically, certainly over the next 12, 24, and 36 months, as more and more, especially in healthcare, everybody wants to put everything on the wireless. So we have a couple polling questions to kind of gauge the audience. And um, polling question number one, um, have you considered deploying an all-wireless office? I'll give you a second to answer that. And I'll share those results here in a few minutes. So what does a Wi-Fi guy look like? Now, friends, I can tell you that we do not have the luxury of plugging in a cable, right? As wireless engineers, we're that guy in the weeds. The connection between the client and the access point is the most critical piece for us. You know, once that packet hits the AP, hits the controller, and goes out to the routers and switches and off to the Internet, that's one piece all in of itself. But the connection between the wireless device and the access point, that's where we live, and that's where we spend a lot of our time. 
And I'm going to say it again. We don't have that luxury of plugging in the cable and it just works. As a wireless engineer in the weeds, we need to look at drivers, right? We need to look at supplicant configurations. And then you know as well as I do, if there's ever an issue on a wireless client, and it may not be a wireless-related issue, it could be application, it's a wireless problem. So now as wireless engineers, we have to be application experts, right? And, and, and I'm sure if, if we had the webcams on, I'd see a lot of head shaking, yes, right? So, so you know, we all live in this same bucket. But that's the guy there. He's in the weeds. We have to know a lot about the infrastructure and especially that piece between the access point and the client as well as applications. The image on the right there is my CWNA book. I'm a big fan of CWNP. That was one of my first books. And yes, it's held together with duct tape. Um, still a very good book and uh, highly promote uh, CWNP for, for vendor neutral um, education. How I start all my sessions. Um, I like to have folks take away two things from any one of my sessions that go for about an hour in length. And I think it's very important. That's my goal when I sit down and I, I attend someone's session is to what are two or three things that I could take away um, and possibly either read and educate myself more on or maybe look at implementing that in my network. So let's start with the first one. Here's a question for you. What does Wi-Fi stand for? And I think this might be a takeaway for some of you folks out of those two things for the next hour. A lot of folks will immediately answer that as wireless fidelity. But friends, I will tell you Wi-Fi stands for nothing. It's not even an acronym. It has no meaning. And that comes from Phil, one of the founding members of the Wi-Fi Alliance. So maybe some of you have know, knew that, maybe some of you didn't. But uh, interestingly enough, as you go through and you talk about Wi-Fi, which, and I've traveled the world, it's amazing. You can hear people speak different language, and all of a sudden you hear Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi. Um, it, it's not an acronym. It doesn't have any meaning. It's a made-up term. It's a marketing term. So the last five years, if you really look at wireless as a whole, engineers' roles have changed. You know, five, six years ago, we were more worried about RF, deploying access points and designs, Today, we're looking for, we're, we're managing BYOD, Internet of Things, ICE, wayfinding, and even more. So as wireless engineers, our roles are expanding, and those responsibilities are expanding. Now, here are some quick um, mentions that I've said over the years that I wanted to add in this session as well. <clears throat> Users are quick to blame your Wi-Fi network if there's a crappy application or a device doesn't operate to their expectations. Many of the users, our customers today, get their expectations from the mobile devices, from the cellular world, right? Think about that for a moment. The cellular world has become very reliable. It's not like cellular 10 or 15 years ago. These phones are very reliable, and, and our users have those same expectations. And many users confuse sometimes cellular with Wi-Fi, right? We've seen that. We get called out saying, hey, the Wi-Fi isn't working. Well, they're not even connected to Wi-Fi. They're in the area of a building that doesn't have good cell coverage because it, it, it sets those expectations. Additionally to that, if you look at indoor wayfinding, users get those same expectations from the blue dot that we get from our outdoor GPS experience, right? So the bar is held high for our users. They want that same level of expectation. And I mentioned before, the connection between the Wi-Fi client and the wireless access point is only a small part of the overall network communication, but in terms of Wi-Fi reliability, it's the most important. So let's set the tone here for our, our, our all wireless office discussion. Um, first of all, how did this come about? And let me set the groundwork. So about four years ago, we were looking to implement an EMR system called EPIC. And for healthcare friends, it's a name that's probably very familiar to you. For our non-healthcare friends, think of a system-wide uh, software uh, solution that manages uh, from soup to nuts, everything within your organization. Um, in healthcare, we have a lot of organic systems, systems that are tied together through APIs. Well, Epic comes in and it pretty much takes away a lot of those individual standalone systems and gives you that one pane of glass. So in order to prep for Epic, we had to pick in-house experts in the various fields. And in doing so, we needed to house them in an office somewhere away from um, uh, 
the, the hospital. So we rented a five-story building um, on the outskirts of the med center, and we occupied those two floors. Our director came to us and said, hey, what do you think about doing an all-wireless office? And, and I can see the expressions of my team members all excited, and I think we all wanted to say yes, but we realized the amount of time and dedication that we would need to do in order to make that successful. It's not a matter of just hanging access points and walking away. We realized that that was not going to be something that was going to be an easy task. And remember, this is three years ago almost. So after some consideration and some commitments, especially getting commitments from our management saying, if we have issues, we will back you, because that is so important. And uh, so we moved forward with that. We, we went with the all wireless design, and, and there's a huge cost savings, and I have a couple of slides in the back of that to talk about it. But our main goal was not just to be, let's see if we can do it, but take lessons learned in the all wireless office and deploy in the greater enterprise. Because that's really where the value's at. So we forged forward. And these were some of the design prerequisites. And I'm sure you're going to have many more. In fact, these were some of the top ones that we looked at. You know, defining the requirements, right? Very basic networking if you're going to design a network. What are the user requirements? What kind of devices are they going to be bringing in? Um, applications, et cetera. Device requirements. Um, you know, are we looking to design data, voice, or location? What about our high density? Um, what about ultra high density? Are we looking at 2.4 or 5 gigahertz? What about our future growth requirements? Now let me talk specifically on some of these. So in deploying our all wireless office, we had a legacy 2.4 network, and that's where all of our data lived. Our voice network was separate from that. It was on 5 gigahertz. In the all wireless office, we moved all of our production devices to 5 gigahertz along with our voice. And that allowed us to test the network, do sampling, do baselining, is it okay for us to mingle both voice and data? How is it going to work in this Petri dish? And the results were promising for us. So we ended up taking some of that data and, and um, lessons learned and moving that to our infrastructure, which I'll share here in a little bit. But also looking at this, when I say all wireless office, there are conference room phones that aren't uh, Wi-Fi. Obviously, it's challenging to find wireless conference room phones and printers. So everything else is wireless. And friends, when I say wireless, um, there are no cables for backup. If a controller goes down, if an AP goes down, it's a bad day. There are no cables for the folks in their cubes and offices to plug into. So it was important for us to make sure we can get reliability as close to wired expectations as possible. So again, part of this too, and, and I wanted to add some of this into the slides, is understanding basic fundamentals. You know, Wi-Fi will get blamed for device and application shortfalls. And again, right now, I think if we had our webcams on, I'd see a lot of head shaking, right? And, and that's why as wireless engineers, you know, we have to a lot of times understand applications. In fact, as a group, as a my wireless group, I should say, when it comes to very specific applications like Epic and some other ones, uh, my team happens to know uh, those applications better than the application folks. And, and I say that not surprisingly, but when they have problems, immediately application folks want to throw up their hands and say, it's a network issue, right? So it's, it's on us to prove that it's not. And a lot of times it actually gets down to, and this happened recently, putting Wireshark on a wireless laptop and experience the issues and then actually looking at the layer three frames and explaining to them, hey, this is not a wireless problem. Look, it's your application, right? Looking at uh, Wi-Fi as a half duplex medium. Now, Waves 2 AC changes that, but understand you know, as a whole, you know, Wi-Fi is a half duplex medium on our legacy protocols. And anyone can deliver a green map for coverage. And let me say that again. You know, anyone can deliver a green map. It's understanding what that green map means. A lot of times people just want to look at first AP coverage. You have to look at second AP coverage for optimal roaming. You have to look at third AP coverage if you're trying to do any type of location. All too often, people just say, hey, I have a green map. I must have good coverage. Not necessarily always true, right? Um, our own access points cause most of the interference on today's networks, believe it or not. It's a true story. Um, if you look at a lot of the network designs today, if you look at contention and you know, managing almost 7,000 access points, I can tell you that our own access points, if not powered, channeled, and placed properly, um, we cause our own interference. And uh, I'm hoping to do another session just on that 
uh, topic and really dive deep. And roaming on 802.11 and 802.1x, certainly two different um, expectations. Roaming on 802.11 is just transitioning from cell to cell. Roaming on 802.1x, obviously you have opportunistic key caching in 802.11r when you're using EAP, for example, extensible authentication protocol. Um, so while you may have roaming successful on 802.11, but you may have, uh, you may not be, your clients may not be subscribing to opportunistic key caching, for example, and have hard roams. So those are things that are important. And then understanding 2.4 and 5. Now in the Med Center, I can tell you, um, we are housed um, and sandwiched in around other medical institutions. So their access points are always blaring into our buildings. So of course, 2.4 is very challenging for us. So that was another reason why we needed to get away from our 2.4 legacy network and move our production devices over to 5 with our voice. And mitigating neighboring access points, right? It's part of that whole CCI and, and channelization. Some other things that was very important to us when we were looking at the design of the all wireless office is that we did not want to subscribe to a hallway design. And friends, if you look to the image on the left, you're going to see that's an access point placed in a hall. And this is real live data. It's driven from air magnet. Those red arrows that you see are where we actually took actual readings. And you can see that access point has very strong signal at voice, neg 67, up and down the hall. But you're going to see we're not getting the penetration in the rooms. And if you look to the right, take that same access point, place it into the room, and you can see where you can use the walls as barriers for attenuation, effectively blocking the signal and limiting CCI. So, and this was one of our challenges in the all wireless office, how we place our access points. Because remember, everybody's going to be Wi-Fi. And what we found is that sometimes we needed to get creative with our access points, creative on the powering, creative on the placement. In fact, sometimes placing an access point under a, a, a desk, believe it or not, and powering it down you're actually making a smaller cell of coverage and you're allowing clients to migrate or associate to other access points rather, rather than put it in the ceiling and it's nice and bright, it's a shiny object for all the clients to gravitate towards. So in the all wireless office, you may not have the opportunity of a lot of walls. Sometimes you have to be creative in your placements. And, not, and, and again, don't necessarily rule out putting them in some creative areas. And also too, and, and again, leading up to our all wireless office, we needed to understand you know, how the, the coverage patterns of access points were working, especially with the newer access points, the 37 and 3800s. They go up to 200 milliwatt in transmission power. And what you're going to see here is just some testing that my team has done and looking at coverage first, second, and third AP coverage here um, at different transmission powers. So you can see here the top rows, the first AP coverage, and at the different power settings. So you can see as you power up or down an access point, it does indeed create holes. And again, friends, this is, this is real live data. This isn't mock data. It's not uh, a predictive survey. This is actually somebody walking the floor and getting into every single room. And then again here, if you look here, um, our third AP coverage and then our noise here, again, at different uh, uh, transmission powers. And again, the whole point here is to share with you, we just don't go out and throw up access points. We want to understand what, those coverage look, what the coverage looks like. And again, the last slide here, looking at our SNR and, and our CCI. Uh, CCI and CCC, uh, co-channel interference, co-channel contention, same thing, just different terms of, of uh, uh, how you want to call it. And that dark blue that you see there, you can just see as we started turning down the powers, we made some of that contention go away. Also, too, um, in, in dealing floor to floor, it was very important for us. We wanted to understand how much bleed through we were going to have. And friends, what you're looking at here is an access point placed on a floor. And this data is from two floors above this, this, uh, this access point. So the very first row that you see here is our access point powered at 6 milliwatt, 12, 25, all the way up to 200 milliwatt. And this is the floor above where the access point's at. So you can see the amount of coverage that we're getting at 200 milliwatt. The row below that 200 milliwatt is two floors above. And again, you can still see we're covering about three to four offices. So again, you want to keep yourself small. And, and this was a really, it was eye-opening for us and the team because how much transmission power and you know, what is the length of these, these throws from the, the access point? And keep in mind, this is actually at NEG 67. So this is voice grade two floors up. <clears throat> so the second polling question. Um, do you standardize on wireless NICs for your production devices? 
And I think that's very important. Let me share with you why. As we get into the slides here for our all wireless office, one of the things that we learned is that when we fired up the network, I can tell you the first two to four months was very rough for us. And while we had a, a green map and while we had coverage everywhere, we were still getting problems, right? We were still seeing issues where people were saying that, you know, they're getting disconnects and, you know, the network was slow, et cetera. And one of the things that we did at Methodist, and we standardized on many years ago, was our wireless NICs in production devices. And that in and of itself has lent itself tremendously um, to providing reliable Wi-Fi. And let me share with you why. When you have an all-wireless office or even a large enterprise, if you can standardize on your wireless NICs, it gives you the ability to have one neck to choke. Because when you purchase, let's say, your production devices, you have that option of picking a Broadcom chip, for example, a Realtek or a, a, uh, uh, an Intel. And if you don't specify, a lot of times the, the bean counter will select it for you, and it's going to be the cheapest one, right? But if you can standardize on your wireless NICs, what that allows you to do is focus in on very specific drivers and test those specific drivers, right? And when you get to a driver that's working successfully, then deploy it through GPO through all of your other devices. So let's, let's now dive into all the specifics of the all-wireless office. So we have 3,700s. We have access points in local sniffer and monitor mode. Um, it was very important for us when deploying the all-wireless office that we had to have the ability to do sniffing. And one of the challenges that you have is that you can't necessarily be everywhere all the time. So we ended up deploying a sniffer access point on many of the access points that you, in the all-wireless office. So if we had an access point on channel 40, we would have an access point next to it sniffing channel 40. We had that going back to an um, uh, 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 Savvius OmniPeak appliance where we can sniff 24 hours, seven days a week. In the all wireless office, we took inventory of all the users and all of their devices and their MAC addresses. So if Dr. John had a problem at four o'clock, we can go through the Excel spreadsheet and say, okay, hey, here's all of his MAC addresses. His problem was on his Lenovo. Okay, that's his Intel NIC card. Let's start looking at the sniffer captures, right? Um, so that was very, very helpful for us. Um, part of the all wireless details, well, you know, we started off at 20 megahertz. We're now up to 40 megahertz bonding. Um, we have 6205, 7260, and 7265 wireless NICs as the majority of our production devices. We have a production SSID on 5 gigahertz. Our guess is on 2.4. And as I mentioned, we have... Uh, uh, you know, 40 access points and, and our anchoring, et cetera. So in doing our assessment, you can see this is one floor of the two. We did, we walked in every single room, and sometimes, friends, we walked in there three or four times. Uh, we needed to do and make sure that we had uh, the quote-unquote green map and that we had first and second AP coverage throughout the facility. Now, a lot of these folks are stationed at a desk, but keep in mind, a device, even sitting still, can roam. So we needed to make sure that roaming was optimal. So what are some of our challenges in deploying all wireless office? First and foremost, you need to have a mental checkbox. Regardless if it's your, an all wireless office or a enterprise grade network, if you don't have a mental checkbox that your RF is optimized and your configuration is optimal, you know, you're already behind the ball. So those are things that were very important for us. User perception, wireless. And I can tell you, when folks were told that they were going to come over to the all wireless office, perception was not good. And we realized quickly after they got there why. Because while we thought we did a good job of managing drivers, what we found was is that the driver pushes, or the, the drivers were actually getting on the devices at the time of imaging. So, you know, you have folks coming into the all wireless office, they're bringing their corporate laptops, but what we're finding is they all have different drivers on them. And we found that that was the biggest culprit that we had. Again, management buy-in, staying in front of issues, being visible to users. Wi-Fi takes the engineer out of the cube. When was the last time that the security guy needed to talk to Dr. John or, you know, uh, the application guy needed to talk to Nurse Betty? It's rare that that happens. But from a wireless, user, uh, wireless engineering perspective, that happens a lot. So it takes us out of the cube. We need to be visible in front of the users. We had to take all their concerns seriously. You know, that was very critical for us. 
you know, if a user had a concern, we had to document it, we needed to do follow-up, and what we did is we started to paint a picture. As all these concerns started coming in, we started to see a theme of what those issues were. We had to speak to the users, or to the issues, in a way that the users could understand them. Um, we always copied, in ma many cases, copied users on back and forth emails at times, especially if we found out if the issue wasn't a wireless issue, if it was an application issue. Because we wanted these guys to understand, one, that we're in it with them, and two, that if it's not a wireless issue, try not to blame wireless for everything. And we would ask for feedback, and I can tell you the first two to four months in walking through the all wireless office, it was a bad situation. You know, it was also, I was, I was like, kind of like hanging my head low and please don't talk to me kind of deal, right? I know we have problems, but I also wanted people to know that it was okay to call my baby ugly, right? Because these were issues that we needed to work through. And we did have some issues, and these are the big issues that we had. Um, first, we had our client Intel issues. Secondly, we had a Cisco 7925 cradle Bluetooth issue. And let me share with you on that one. So we distribute 79, Cisco 7925 to all the users. And friend, there's, there's about 300 users there. So they have the Cisco phones, they have the cradles, and immediately they're saying, hey, we're having voice issues. Now mind you, we did throughput testing, we did uh, continuous phone calls, we did roaming tests, we found no problems. So we had a mental checkbox that it's not the wireless network and it wasn't the phones. And then when we get on site, we actually found the 7925s were being cradled into the Bluetooth cradle. And when you did that and you held a call, you would have intermittent speech. But if you took the phone out of the cradle, the phone call was fine. We did packet captures. We didn't see any packet loss. So we related that to a connectivity issue between the phone and the cradle. We opened up a ticket. It went on for some time. It never got resolved. So what we had to do is set expectations with our users. Hey. If you don't use the cradle with the phone, you're going to be fine. But if you do, understand that you're going to experience this issue. Not only did we send that in an email, but we had the group go through, and if we happen to see phones on the cradle, we just remind folks, hey, just remember that you know, there's an issue. It's a known issue. Um, the expectation right now is not to use the phone in the cradles. So again, user perception is very important. The biggest issue we had is with Intel. And I'm not sure if we have any Intel friends here on the, the – uh, the WebEx, but I will, I will tell you that Intel has done a fantastic job for us. It, it was a rocky road um, for a number of months, but we got to a point in working with Intel, they actually provided us a debug driver, which I had no idea even existed. You put this debug driver on a box, and it will gather up to a gig or more worth of data, believe it or not. And we would take this data and, and drop box it to the engineers over at Intel. They would provide us test drivers to, to work through some of these issues. Well, I wish this would have you know, our success would have happened a lot sooner. Um, we did have a lot of problems. It took some time to figure out, but I'm so very thankful. And, and uh, while I don't want to mention any names, the, if someone from Intel is reading, or watching this, either now or in the future recording, uh, we do appreciate um, everything that you've done for us. And I'm going to talk to you on some of those issues. Uh, distinguishing Wi-Fi issues from application issues. You know, I can honestly tell you, Working with users, because everything's a Wi-Fi issue, we were able to work with them on a one-to-one -one basis to say, hey, I understand you have a Wi-Fi problem. I've seen the ticket come in. You know, let's look at this. And then educate them to say, hey, you know what? This isn't a wireless issue. This is an application issue. You know, can you get out to the Internet? You know, we set up in-house speed tests. Can you get to the speed test? What are, what, what are your up and down rates? You know, if they're within these levels, it's not a Wi-Fi issue. And we were making small wins with these users, and that's what it took. Again, setting user expectations, testing devices, and driver testing. Again, management buy-in. You know, if it wasn't for management buy-in, I could tell you the first two to four months, users wanted, wanted a cable. And management came back and said, hey, listen, you need to give these guys an opportunity to fix these issues because it's just not about the all-wireless office, but it's about what we're going to learn Certainly, when you start to put your Epic apps on the wireless, these guys will have a better understanding and a head start to see if there's any issues, to work through those issues now, a year and a half, two years ahead of time, before it actually gets deployed. And I can tell you that's been very successful for us. Getting a head start and looking at issues, because this is where all the development is happening. So if you're going to have problems, you're going to see it here first before it actually goes out to the enterprise. You know, and 
staff education is part of and part of the all wireless office. One of the things, don't ever think you're just going to fire up access points and leave. If you did that and you didn't do your due diligence with a design, you didn't do your due diligence with uh, device testing and driver testing, you're not going to be successful. You're just not. It, it's, it takes a lot of hard work and educated staff with proper tools to be really successful in this. You know, it's critical to have staff that, you know, that's dedicated to the cause. Um, you know, you can't just have one person that's able to read packet captures. You know, you know, that one person can't be everywhere all the time. So it's having a team dedicated and understanding to read frames, understand what those frames are telling them, have a solid foundation in deploying an RF network. Again, you just don't want to throw up access points because you might actually be doing yourself a disservice by causing too much interference, for example. And the other thing that's very important, again, I always try to stress is ability to communicate with your end users. Your end users are your measuring stick, right? They are. If you're doing a good job and you're keeping the network reliable, they're going to be your best friends. But when you start to have problems, they could also be your worst enemies too, right? Because all of a sudden, these folks start getting the cooler water, uh, water cooler talk, and now everybody's having an issue, right? And I already mentioned about being creative on where you're placing access point, because that's very important. Um, sometimes some of the areas that you may not have considered in a normal design, when you're doing an all wireless office, you may have to consider, like I mentioned, either under desks or um, in some rather interesting areas to keep the CCI down. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of what our issues were in the all wireless office. So 80% of the Wi-Fi issues are client related. Um, if you have a mental checkbox on your network, your RF is designed properly, your configuration is optimal, um, when a ticket comes in, one of the first things you can do is if there's been no changes in the network, for example, if there's been, you know, no down access points, the controllers are up, you know, there's no interference, you can almost move from it being a network issue to start focusing on the device. And that's where we were with uh, the all wireless office. We started seeing after we had our mental checkbox done on the RF, everything was solid, we started getting complaints from users and we started collecting that data. And the theme was very similar. One was the sleeping issue, where if you were to close the lid to the laptop or if the device would go to sleep, wireless wouldn't re-engage. Um, the bigger issue we had was with the yellow exclamation point. And I know when I did this session before and I spoke to other folks, they've experienced the same issue, and I'll share with you in more detail in, in, an, in another si slide here. And in devices where you may not be able to manage your driver or NIC, for example, like Apple and perhaps Surfaces, you know, would you, you're dealt the cards that you have. So what you have to do is test those devices, you know, specifically like Surfaces. They come with the Mar Marvell chips, so you have to go through and do the due diligence on those chips, see how they roam, see how they hear the network from an RSSI perspective. Um, so while we can gather up the majority of the devices, the corporate-owned distributed assets, laptops, et cetera, that have our dedicated Intel uh, chips in them, um, we can navigate what driver goes on those. Now, currently, we're on the 1820.0.9 driver. And you're probably wondering, well, that's a pretty old driver. Why are you on an old driver? Well, we don't like to upgrade just for the sake of upgrading. If the driver works, we leave it alone. Unless there's a compelling reason for us to upgrade, whether it be through a feature or through a, um, uh, a bug that we find that's impactful, then we'll update. But of all the drivers that we've tested and working closely with Intel, this is the driver that we've standardized on. Now, I will tell you, we are looking at newer drivers. Um, we haven't necessarily put our flag in the sand to say, hey, this is our newest, latest, and greatest driver that we're going to be moving to. But we are looking at two to three different drivers currently. Um, they are in the 19 family of Intel. Um, and hopefully, we'll complete testing in the next couple weeks that we'll start looking at pushing those out through GPO um, in small groups. So the client device issues, this was our biggest issue in the all wireless office, is the Intel issue. And you can actually see a picture of that there. With this issue, um, you'd have a, a wireless client and they would be on the network and all of a sudden, um, they would lose all layer three connectivity. Now friends, when we found this issue, it was random in nature, we could not reproduce it. Um, there wasn't like a, a timing or a signature that said, hey, if I do this, that issue is gonna pop up. So the only way we're able to re really capture this is that we had to dedicate team to the all wireless office. These are folks that were in the office, you know, from eight o'clock to six o'clock, 
they would do rounding and say, if you have any wireless issues, please call me. I'll be sitting in this cube over here. And he would get calls. And he would rush out and he would take pictures. And we'd start to go through the troubleshooting process. And in this particular instance, we not only caught the issue, but we loaded Wireshark on the box. We created a video of it. We had over-the-air captures. So when you're troubleshooting a wireless issue, there's three important parts. You capture the debugs from the infrastructure, whether it be AP or controller. You capture logs and any other information you can get from the client. So now you captured both sides. Right? You captured infrastructure, what that is telling, and what the device is telling. And the last part, and the most critical, and it's what I call the lie detector, is the over-the-air captures. Right? So those are three of the most important po points when troubleshooting a wireless network. The device, the infrastructure, and over the air. And we actually did that with this particular issue. And what we found was is that all layer three would break. Multicast would, frames would come in, and they would actually go up the stack. But other than that, all layer three broke. In the wireless LAN controller, you'd actually see the client in the run state. So the infrastructure thought the client was fine. Over the air captures, we seen packets that were previously sent from the client to the AP, and the AP was acting on them. And we've seen these floods of acts. Eventually, the controller AP stopped sending those acts. But it was like the client just disappeared and walked away. And you would see this yellow exclamation point. Now, this issue got fixed in 182009. But interestingly enough, it got reintroduced in 1830. This is why I'm saying just don't jump on the latest and greatest driver. Because sometimes, like in 1830, the issue gets reintroduced. But that in of itself was our biggest problem that we had in the all-wireless office. When we had this resolved, I can tell you probably about 75 to 80 percent of our complaints went down. But the only way that you're going to solve that problem is not just by throwing drivers at it, but actually diagnosing, seeing the issue, and trying to do, like I mentioned, those three areas, the client, infrastructure, and over the air. Some other things we've seen, and this is actually an interesting one, is Intel UAPSD. We actually had a user going through and nerd knobbing because they were having some issues. And they said the network was really slow. So we go there and we didn't experience this. But one thing that they had on was UAPSD. With Intel and Cisco, and, and I don't know all the workings behind it, there, there is some good documentation behind there. From what I understand, it's a negotiation issue on how um, the, the two are, are working together. But if you enable UAPSD on an Intel NIC, look at the throughput up and down. That same driver or, or, or same client under the same AP, just disabling it, look at the difference. Right? So, again, this takes us into the weeds, right? Because who's going to get to this level? So as wireless engineers, we need to actually start looking at and, and understanding all those, those behind-the-scenes workings. I mentioned the Intel sleep issue. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had is devices would go to sleep or users would actually close the laptop, and lo and behold, the wireless card would disengage, wouldn't reassociate, and users would have to reboot. The more technically inclined users would actually just go through and disable the NIC and re-enable it. But now imagine those users that may have had work saved, maybe in the middle of an email, and you know all that hassle they have to go through, save their work, drop off the network, reboot, come back on the network. And again, this was fixed, and, and we haven't seen this come back in even some of the newer drivers. Now, when we start talking about the All Wireless Office, we kind of shared a little bit about why we did it, um, you know, a little bit about our deployment and, and the hardware that we're using, and talked about some of our issues. But really, the meat and potatoes is in the, the user perception. So what you're looking at here are a bunch of users that we caught on individual basis. We didn't do a group discussion. And if you look, the column on the left is 17.204, and the column on the right is 18.20. So we went and talked to users before we did a code upgrade and asked them to grade the wireless network. And you're going to see on the 1712 driver, they graded the network four, fives, and sixes. Not a very good grade. User perception was low. Now, I want you to look on that blue column to the right, but look at the voice. At that same time, users are grading our voice network that's riding on the same access points on the same 5 gigahertz channels as 8, 9s, and 10s. But if I can get voice to work, which is much more critical, I can surely get data to work. But that all goes down to that driver. So we ended up updating the driver to 182009, and you can see that right here um, on that column left of the blue. And we got users, and again, we let it bake in six to eight weeks. In fact, Carlos was there for, for this, 
uh, presentation uh, or for this walk around, and we asked users to rate the network. And they came back with eight nines and tens. Now, friends, if you look at the voice at the two times that we graded it, still eight nines and tens. The only thing we changed was an Intel driver. That's it. A driver that we tested, a driver that we validated, a driver that we understood or had previous concerns with, and we validated that this driver didn't reintroduce any of those problems. I want to mention, again, you need to have a metal checkbox if you're deploying an all-wireless office or if you're deploying an enterprise network, large or small. You need to make sure the RF is designed correctly. You need to make sure your configuration is optimal and keep the config simple. I personally don't subscribe to band select and band steering and all those things. I want to have a vanilla configuration. For me, when you start to add all of that extra complexity, and in some designs you might need to have some of that complexity, but if your design does not require it, try to limit that. So for example, we could have had a 2.4 network for just data, um, or I'm sorry, a 5 gigahertz network for data and voice and have it on a single SSID perhaps, but we wanted to actually, or I'm sorry, let me take, take that back. You can have a 2.4 and 5 gigahertz data for, for data and voice. We actually separated our data for a legacy 2.4 and our data for 5 gigahertz. For devices that we can control through GPOs, we can move those corporate devices over to the 5 gigahertz WLAN. And I can tell you, once we did that move, it was instrumental. We were watching users move over from 2.4 and 5 and knowing that they were just getting a better overall networking experience. Now questions come up, well, why didn't you just have a 2.4 and a 5 gigahertz network for production and let the client choose? Well, the problem is wireless devices don't always make the best choices. So while you might have a network that has 2.4 and 5 gigahertz enabled, when an issue comes up, you don't know if it was a 2.4 problem with congestion or a 5 gigahertz problem. And in our testing, what we did is we found clients sometimes don't always make those best choices. Whereas if I can move clients over to a dedicated 5 gigahertz WLAN, because I know that they support 5 gigahertz, I, don't have, I can take out that, that equation of them jumping over to a 2.4 network, for example. So those are things that I look at as why I'm saying keep it simple. Rounding. I have to tell you, rounding is so important. Um, getting in front of your users, ask users for first-hand accounts, try to reproduce issues. Um, and let me give you two examples that, that were very impactful for, for us at the All Wireless office. You know, as I'm going and doing my rounding, I'm talking to users, I'm popping in cubes. Hey, how's the wireless network today? Are you having any problems? Oh, no, everything's fine. Go into the next cube. Hey, how's everything going? Oh, everything's good. Pop in an office here, pop in an office there. How's everything going? All oh, good. And then I come up on this, this gal and I'm like, hey, how's the wireless? Oh, it stinks. Well, wait a minute. I just talked to like four or five other people. They're saying everything's fine. So what's the problem, right? Let me, let me understand. And, you know, she says, well, you know, I come in the morning. I connect to all my applications. I have my Epic up. I'm building these modules. I have my shared drives. You know, everything's good. And you know what? When I go to a meeting, if I leave my laptop here, if I go to lunch, when I come back, you know, the wireless is broken. I can't connect. I said, well, you know what? Lunch is coming up here in the next 20 minutes. I'm going to hang around. You go to lunch. When you come back, I want to see your experience. So sure enough, we do that, and she comes back, and, and she's not connected. She's having problems. So I start looking. I'm going through, and guess what? The guest profile was set as first in her wireless supplicant. So when her NIC went to sleep, and when it came back up, guess what network he connected to? It was the guest network which doesn't have access to anything on the inside. So while she wanted to blame the wireless as being the issue, it was really an ordering issue. So, you know, how do we fix that? Well, we block all the guests from production devices. <laughs> so we, we sent out a GPO and, and just block all guests because, one, we don't want our production devices on guests. And, two, how many more users are like this user that is potentially ha has the wrong ordering, Right. And the other issue that we had when we did the all wireless office was mixed drivers. And that's one of the things that we needed collectively internally to fix. So our drivers, we were working with imaging folks and telling them, hey, this is the driver we want to put on all the images. Well, as we made updates to drivers as we were going and progressing, you know, those old machines, got the old drivers never got updated. Only the newest machines did. 
So when all these folks showed up with their laptops at Epic, um, at our all wireless office, we realized, whoa, wait a minute, these guys are on all these different drivers. We need to get everybody on the on the the currently approved driver. So that's where GPO came into uh, came into effect. We're able to actually push out drivers, and we're to a point now where we feel very confident that you know we worked out all the kinks. When we test a driver, and when we do our driver testing, we we not only do it here internally on our own machines, but then we push it out to small select groups, and then we'll push it out geographically. For example, not globally, we'll push it out to a small office. We'll have some IT folks there and ask for feedback. If the feedback that we get is good or bad, we try to work with those those folks, figure out what those issues are. And then when we feel comfortable, then we do mass pushing out to um, our global entities. So for example, each underlying hospital. We'll do a push out to one hospital. We'll let it sit and bake for maybe three or four days. If there's no issues, then we push it out to the next one, so on and so forth. But that was another big issue that we had is that we weren't doing, we weren't being very good stewards of our drivers. And seeing firsthand the Intel drivers that we had, you can see and understand why we needed to. And I mentioned about 2.4 and 5 gigahertz on production. I'm not going to beat the dead horse here, but um, again, reason why we moved everything just to 5 gig is because of the legacy um, 2.4 uh, as far as uh, the amount of contention in the network and where we're situated in Houston, it's very challenging because of neighboring access points. And 5 gigahertz, obviously, there's less interference, you know, microwave ovens and the like on there. Um, but it was a big learning curve for us. Right? We had to educate our staff, uh, meaning our field team and our desktop folks, that, hey, our old network is going to be 2.4. We're introducing this new network, and you're going to see that difference. right? When you're working on a device, you might see a device that's going to be on 5 gigahertz. And we've gotten very creative with our imaging that we can put on just the 5 gigahertz WLAN on devices that support 5. And remember when I mentioned you know, distinguishing Wi-Fi issues from device and application. You know, it's so very important. Um, as a wireless engineer, our roles are changing. We need to understand more about applications. And specifically, I can tell you from like, like an Epic perspective, um, you know, my team um, has done a fantastic job. We document a lot of the issues that we find. This way, if it ever reoccurs again, we have some documentation to go back and say, hey, we've seen this issue before. You know, we were recent, recently on the floor for a week troubleshooting an application problem that was deemed as a wireless issue. And we took a week, did packet captures and everything else. We found SSO login issues. We found um, some other application issues. So you know, a lot of times we take the black eye for the team, but it's always good to go back. And, and a lot of that involves you know, having a robust tool set, for example, OmniPeak and NetScout um, that we use here. So device testing, you know, in, in many hospitals, a lot of hospitals are looking for that one device. Our, our doctors have so much stuff in their pockets that the jackets have a swagger about them. So we're trying to eliminate, you know, the pager, and believe it or not, people still carry pagers. You know, the scanner, the personal phone, et cetera. Um, so we're looking for that one magical device. And we've done a lot of device testing. And this is just one screenshot of, I can tell you, dozens of uh, the data that we've collected here. So we just don't turn it on and does it work, okay, deploy it. We're looking at RSSI. We're looking at how the devices perform under interference. Um, we're looking at how those devices hear the, uh, the receive sensitivity on the, on the network. Because if you have a device that doesn't hear very well, guess what? You're going to have to add more access points, right? And if you add more access points, it changes the overall dynamic design. So a lot of device testing we do. And that mental checkbox, what you're looking at here is a picture of the all-wireless office before it went live. And what you're looking at there is we needed to stress test the network. I needed to have a mental checkbox that when we went live, that if somebody said they had a voice issue, I can rule out it being too many phones on an access point. What you're looking at there is each phone is calling each other. We turned off all the access points except for one, and we wanted to see the loading and breaking point of that AP. And where does call quality start to degrade? Where does CAC kick in, for example? It's all about the mental checkbox. If you think you're just going to throw out access points, get a green map, and it's going to work, you only did half your job. You have to put it under a load. You have to test roaming. You have to test your throughput. You have to look at how clients are behaving. You have to turn on interference, example, to see how these clients uh, come back onto the network. And clients hear differently. And here's a great example. You're going to see two Cisco, uh, a Cisco phone with two ASCOM phones. Believe it or not, the ASCOM phone on the right and the Cisco phone on the left have the same instrument, Texas instrument chip. They both hear the network at the same decibel, receive sensitivity. But look at that ASCOM phone in the middle. It's almost 10 dB off. 
right? So, you know, it's getting to this level of device testing to understand how those devices are going to work on your network. Picking power users. I can't tell you that how important that is. When you're deploying an all wireless office, you have to gravitate towards folks that you're going to get good and reliable information um, to stop the finger pointing. So if you attempt to do an all wireless office, certainly try to pick those wireless uh, super users, events. I already mentioned keep your config simple. Now let's talk about the bean counting, right? Now your numbers certainly could look a lot different than these, but if you're deploying, in our case, an all wireless office where it's rental space, the biggest cost associated to us is cabling, and that cabling is going to be left. So in the next year or so, when we leave that, that place, you know, that cabling's left, and, and so is whatever we spent on that cabling. So if you look at these numbers here, you know, if you go from what the wired infrastructure would look like, we're just over half a million dollars. You take that same infrastructure, you eliminate some of the switches, some of the licensing, et cetera, you know, you're down to about $136,000. So a huge price difference. Now, again, your bill material may look different because you might have different standards, but this was a quick view of what we looked at, what our typical standard and build-out is, to versus the all-wireless office. And now you might say, hey, that's a great cost savings. But I can tell you the lessons learned that we took and were able to deploy in a greater enterprise, like the drivers, the GPO pushing, you know, that was really where the value for us came. So the last polling question, do you have a mental checkbox that your wireless design and configuration is optimal? And then, Monica, I think I'm going to let you uh, uh, run with the uh, the results on those, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, and then getting down to one or two slides here, are you ready to deploy an all-wireless office? You know, again, you want to make sure you have managed the support, standardize on your devices and clients as much as you can, have a golden configuration, keep it simple, make sure you're properly, uh, your RF is properly designed, test your network, get in front of issues, pick power users, and make sure you're educating your staff as you go along. And then I'm often asked about tools. So what are some of the tools that we use? The tool that you see on the left is actually a Ruckus tool. Um, it's called SpeedFlex. Um, you can run that on an iPad. A lot of our doctors are using iPads and they're always saying, hey, we're having network issues. Well, what better else than to put an application on an iPad to see whether or not you're having throughput issues? So um, that's a tool that we use. Um, big fan of Savius, also of NetScout. And NetScout, I like to share this because if, we wouldn't have been successful without having our NetScout uh, toolbox. You know, everything from Layer 1, Spectrum XT, to Site Survey, again, creating those green maps, looking at first, second, and third AP coverage, Wi-Fi Analyzer. You know, one of the things when we start having those issues, one of the quickest tools that you could pop open and start taking analysis of the network that gives you, you know, really, really rich, gooey information is the Wi-Fi Analyzer. You can quickly start to look at retries, how many clients are in the network. You can actually see if clients are starting to fail. Um, and then some of the handheld tools that we have, you know, the AirCheck, the OptiView, um, the link runner, and we have a link sprinter. Um, again, very good, robust tools. If, if you're thinking about deploying an all wireless office, you have to have tools. And uh, we're, we're a fan of Air Magnet here, so that's the tools that we use. And when you're starting to talk about devices, it's very difficult to, to have a database of all the different devices that you know your enterprise or clients might bring in. Mike Albana does a great job of collecting driver or device information and what those device NIC, wireless NICs support, you can go to this link here and contribute or consume a lot of the testing that, that Mike has done with um, some of the devices. And last but not least, um, my team here at Methodist. Um, I, I can tell you with, with Gina and Manny and Gustavo, uh, we're dedicated to the cause. And uh, without those guys, I, I can honestly tell you, we would not be successful here. Um, trying to deploy an all wireless office. It takes an all hands on deck. And when you're managing 50,000 wireless clients, 7,000 access points, you know, one or two people can't do that, right? Especially if they're doing route and switch um, at the same time. Um, so we've been featured in, in NetScout as well as uh, a Cisco white paper and video. And uh, we're pretty, uh, pretty ecstatic to have those opportunities. So uh, that's pretty much all that I have. Um, hopefully everybody's still awake. And uh, I hope that everyone was at least to be able to take away one or two things in this last hour that, that can help them on their journey with reliable Wi-Fi. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, George. <laughs> this has been a great presentation. Thank you for everybody that participated in the polling questions.
And also, I see that there has been a very active uh, Q&A, so this is going to be a very nice session for the rest of the presentation today. If you cannot stay for the, for the Q&A, please make sure to click on the evaluation uh, when you close your, your window and provide the, you know, fill out the survey. So let's dwell right now into the live Q&A. So George, I will be asking some of the questions verbally and you just answer. We also have Edgar and Carlos uh, responding many of, of your questions. So the first question to you, um, George, is can you elaborate more uh, on if you will expand your wireless office? Uh, what can, what else can you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, so, so while we're interested in expanding more, um, it has to be the right opportunity to do that, right? And I think the lessons learned that we have here, um, we're going to be looking for those special opportunities. So while we are a, a hospital, um, where we deployed this today is in a carpeted, uh, a carpeted uh, work environment like an enterprise. Um, we are going to be looking at potentially and having discussion with uh, future expansions where we might be doing rental space, where we can take co uh, advantage of the cost savings. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's where we're taking this to the next level as to what other areas we might be expanding in that is going to be rental space that we can take advantage of not having to deploy so much infrastructure and cabling. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and, and a very interesting question is, did you ever want to give up and just pull, the ca pull a cable? Were you uh, in that situation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the first two to four months, I have to tell you, when I walked the all-wireless office, it, 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 I wanted to hide, really. You know, I mean, because, you know, we see all the different devices with the different drivers. We knew we had problems. We knew we had to corral in the driver issues, right? Because as a wireless engineer, one of the first things that happens when you have wireless issues, some folks get that, get that knee-jerk reaction. Oh, I have a wireless problem. Without even going on site, I want to turn up the power. I want to add more access points, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we know, we know better, but it was that knee-jerk reaction that I was like, oh, do we just pull a cable? So uh, uh, it was really uh, – management support was, was really, really critical for us because, you know, people went around us saying, hey, we're having some problems. Uh, we could just pull a cable and end all this. But management came back and said, no, you know mm -hmm. what, we're, we're going to have lessons learned here, and, and we need to stick it out. Perfect. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so that's that's a good piece of advice. Get your management uh, support. <laughs> yes. um, another question is, what is the best solution to protect wireless network? I say that again. What what is the best solution to protect a uh, uh, wireless network? Like basically, from the security standpoint, what what is the best uh, solution that you can provide? Well, you know, I think when you talked about security, you, you have different, uh, obviously, you're doing a pre-share key, you're doing a to an X network, for example. Um, but, you know, we're starting to look at, you know, BYOD, MDMs, and the like. I think from a corporate asset perspective, you know, corporations want to have control of all those assets. If they're going to be smart devices, a lot of corporates are going to MDMs, so they have that full control. Um, you have Cisco ICE on the back end, uh, potentially doing radius attributes and moves. So you can have a single WLAN where now you can um, separate clients via VLAN, so you don't have to have multiple WLANs up front, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really comes down to what is uh, the design requirements, right? If you have a small office, some people get away with a simple pre-share key. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have a more robust corporate environment, you know, you might be looking at EP with locking down the supplicant, or maybe even uh, EPTLS with server-side and client-side certificates. All comes Correct. down to the, the use case. Perfect. Um, another question is, how can we standardize the drivers in the BYOD environment? Yeah, that's a that's problematic, right? In a BYOD environment, you don't necessarily own those assets, right? So it's very challenging. And I think that's where internal discussions have to happen, that um, either A, know that you have a wireless uh, driver issue, um, and it may not be supported. And let me give you a great example is uh, our friends on the other side uh, in universities, right? If you talk to these, uh, like Lee Badman, for example, who's, who's a social butterfly, um, you know, it, some of the challenges that these guys have, right? Because you want to talk about BYOD. Universities are bringing these in by the truckload, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very challenging. Um, I think in a corporate environment, you know, it's BYOD might be best effort. Um, or if you're trying to come to reliable BYOD, you may want to 
start, you know, perhaps working with those users and, and suggesting drivers. Um, a lot of corporates don't want to do that because, you know, all of a sudden something breaks and now you're responsible or you're on the hook for breaking that device that's a personal device. So it's very challenging. Sure. And talking about BYOD, we just got another question is, did you onboard with BYOD devices with MSAE or how do you onboard them? Yeah, so for our BYOD specifically, um, we don't necessarily have a BYOD policy. We have a guest network, and those users can get onto the guest network. And from those devices, uh, certainly if they're Citrix devices, you can go through our Citrix portal. Um, it's what a lot of hospitals are doing today. It's nothing unique to us. Um, but we don't necessarily have a policy where you can bring on personal devices onto the corporate network we can get you on the network through connecting to our guests with those personal devices via VPN or via through a Citrix portal. That's how we do it. Um, you may do it a lot differently from that, but that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another question I've, I think a lot of people are talking about, you know, uh, all wireless or migrating from wireless LAN and LAN together and into into only a wireless LAN. So the first, first question is, isn't it better to have a wireless LAN and LAN together and moving it slowly to a wireless LAN and eliminating LAN? Yeah, certainly. I guess it all comes down to a comfort level. Um, you know, we've had what we'll call that hybrid space for many years. You know, for all of our wired LAN uh, build-outs, we always do wireless. So our typical build-out in an office would be wireless and wired. Mm -hmm. um, so we've already had that practice and those lessons learned. But what you experience is users that use Wi-Fi are typically going from their office to a meeting. And so that experience is very short. Now, when you start to look at on the hospital floor, these are cows that are always on the network all the time. They have tons of applications loaded on them, right? You have to start looking at evaluating those devices. But, yeah, it, it's a comfort level in that, you know, at some point in time, you're going to get to that point of, hey, can we deploy an all-wireless office, perhaps for mm -hmm. that that lease space? Okay. And and just uh, another question around that is, uh, I think you kind of answered, but I think it would be good. Is this really a 100% wireless environment? Uh, what about desk, phones, printers, servers, and video equipment? Right, yeah. So everything is wireless with the exception of conference room phones, which we have four or five and printers. So all users are given a Cisco 7925 phone where they use a soft phone on their laptop. Um, there are no cables to any of the cubes. There are no cables to any of the offices. Um, so as it is, we deem all wireless office. We have, I think it's like six printers that aren't Wi-Fi, which at this point we probably could put on Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. The problem was is that we had field support team that had issues in the past with doing Wi-Fi and printers. And they hesitated saying, hey, we're going to have other issues, right? Do we really want to put printers on there right now? And so right now, since we worked through all those other issues, and it took us about four to five months to work through those issues. And we're, we're coming up on our three-year anniversary. Um, this May will be three years. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then another question is, uh, uh, one person would like to know if there is any specific guidelines for QoS on wireless. Yeah, great question. And I think that could probably be a presentation in of itself, right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I think when we start to look at QoS, I, I think we're we're watching the industry as a whole going to as limited SSIDs as possible. As possible. Um, so a lot of times what you're going to do is look at making sure those devices properly mark. I can tell you most devices aren't marking today. Um, those devices have to mark. And really it becomes to devices that are multi-application. That's really where marking QoS is, is extremely important. Like if you have a laptop and you're doing a WebEx, it's live like this is, and perhaps it's on Wi-Fi. While you're trying to do a download, you want to make sure those, those packets are hitting the proper queuing coming out of your laptop, for example. Um, but ultimately, I think you're going to start to see as a whole, we're going to start eliminating as a, as a, as a you know, corporate here, eliminating the SSIDs we have, come up to one or two SSIDs, and then do allow ICE to do radius backend uh, VLAN switching. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And another question is, how much is Houston Methodist uh, relying on RRM? 
Wow, great question. Another uh, session that you probably spent hours on. So RRM, Ready Resource Management, I can tell you there's a lot of folks that, that disagree with RRM. I, first, I'll tell you, you have to have a properly designed network. If you place APs down a hallway, RRM is going to kick in and, and it's not going to do well because those APs are actually going to shrivel up in, in coverage. Um, so uh, we do subscribe to RRM. We do have some areas where we've done static, um, but for the most part, uh, we are RRM enabled. Um, and when you do RRM, you have to, uh, especially when you're firing up a new site, you have to give it a couple days to, to even itself out. And you might be surprised. Um, if you start to see access points on max power, you need to start looking at those areas, right? Why is that one going to max power? Um, and then, you know, perhaps tune as you need. Uh, we are fans of RRM, but understanding that you need to have a design to support it and that sometimes you might need to modify RM. You might need to do some static channels. But overall, RM does uh, very well for us. Now, some things. Out of the box, RM converges every 10 minutes, right? That's not necessarily a good thing. You want to look at RM and understand it and tune it. You want to give RM a mid and max, right? So if you've designed your network at, let's say, 12.5 milliwatt, you, you might want to limit it and not allow APs go lower than that and you may not want them to go higher than 50 milliwatt, for example. If you just turn on RRM out of the box, probably not the greatest thing, but you really want to understand there's some great documentation out there that explains RRM. Understand all those nerd knobs before, uh, before you, you know, start playing with it. Perfect. Uh, another question, and thank you for everybody. Uh, we have a ton of questions here. Um, can you share the steps used for device and driver test validation? Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> some of the very basic things, right? Um, we have a spreadsheet that we go through, and we look at how well does the device here. Now, when you've already tested um, various variations of the drivers, you start to baseline. And if all of a sudden you introduce a new driver and you see that it's not acting like your test results from the previous driver, you start to note those things. And then you downgrade the driver to see if it behaves back to how it originally was. So some of the things we look for, and these are very basic things, right? Mm -hmm. But again, it's so important that you baseline, you collect this data. This way it gives you something to compare to. So starting off, building that database, if you will, does take some time. But you'll start to see a picture be painted when you start to have uh, testing results from, from new drivers. So for example, uh, we have a corridor that we've measured out, and we take RSSI readings at very specific intervals, and we compare that to how the driver acted before. Uh, we do packet captures. Does it associate to the network? Are we seeing problems with any missed frames, for example? We look at our radius logs. Are we seeing any issues with radius logs, for example? Um, we capture roaming events. Is it supporting opportunistic key caching, and is that working? Is it supporting 802.11 R, K, and V? And do we see that the client's benefiting from that? So it's all those basics. Perfect. And another question is, uh, can SNMP help you administer your corporate wireless lens? You know, um, so we do. We, we have not only Cisco Prime, but we also have a, a third-party uh, Linux box that we do to do some management of, of the network. Um, again, I think it all comes down to individual comfort levels as to um, what software packages they're using. Ideally, if you have a Cisco infrastructure and you have all the different Cisco components, it makes sense to have Cisco Prime. But sometimes you don't necessarily need to see the big 800-pound gorilla. A lot of times you might spin up a, a smaller Linux box like Cacti or another application to, to pull in very specific data. Perfect. And then you also mentioned at some point of the presentation that you could minimize driver issues in a control environment. So the question is, what will be the approach in a BYOD environment like in a school with so many different devices? Yeah, I think it goes back to the earlier question. Um, you know, when you're in that BYOD environment, you don't necessarily have control um, of the drivers on those devices. So. You know, I, I know in working with some universities, um, they will set sometimes some standards saying, hey, if you have a surface, this is the recommended driver that you're on. If you have an Intel 7265, this is the recommended driver. So they 
will not, they won't be able to cover all of them, right? Because what we found is is that you know a lot of times people come with some really old devices, and they work at home and they have no problem. And of course, when they get into the environment, and they have all kinds of issues, it's our network. Mm -hmm. um, so what you try to do is take as many of the low hanging fruit as possible. So publishing any driver testing that you do that you support. For example, if you're doing the Marvell on the Surface, if you're doing the 7260, 7265, or 8260, these are drivers, after you've tested them, say, this is what you support, and make those recommendations to the BYOD users. If you're having a problem, these are the drivers that we've tested that, that have worked on our network without issue. Perfect. And then thanks, oh, questions on how to move people to 5 gigs. So how do you influence cl clients to connect to uh, 5 gigs? instead of a 2.4 bond? Yeah, yeah. So when we did the all wireless office, one of the things that we wanted to do is to um, start to test our 5 gigahertz on voice and data. And I know it sounds like you, you might have a lot of attendees that have been doing this for years, but this was new for us. We've always preserved guests uh, to 2.4. We always preserved 5 for our voice devices. And while we didn't necessarily see any issues in blending the two, but it was the yeah. hurdle, moving them over from the 2.4 to the 5. And what we had done is we did testing. Again, doing GPO pushes, pushing out to, again, very library uh, uh, identified devices, um, deleting the old WLAN, adding the new WLAN, that's a 5 gigahertz WLAN, so that device would not know about the 2.4, and then making sure that device would connect. And it, it took about a week and a week and a half to work through some issues, but we got to a point where we felt very comfortable we could start rolling this out and not worry about an outage, right? All of a sudden we do a push and devices can't get on wireless at all. Now all of a sudden you have to do a manual touch. And remember when you're talking about you know tens of thousands of devices, it's a bad day when you do a push and it doesn't go right. So there was always a fail back plan. Um, when we first originally did this, we added the 5 gigahertz. We never took the 2.4 off. This way, if something went wrong, those devices still could connect back. And then it was the next next approach of, well, just move them to 5 and then delete the old 2.4. So it's a, it's a very calculated, thought-out process um, to ensure that we weren't going to cause any outages. And a lot of testing, I guess. <laughs> um, another question is, what is the best way to help having major bleeds through from other companies on the 5 gigahertz band? to help with the CCI? Yeah, you know, that, that's, that's a challenge, right? You, you, other than knocking on the door and, you know, making friends with the neighbor and saying, hey, turn down your access points, which a lot of times those neighbors won't even know what you're talking about. Um, here in the Med Center, believe it or not, um, we're all friends, right? So when I start looking at some of the neighboring institutions, we often get together um, and, and talk about shop. And we often bust each other's chops, you know, talking about, I see all your SSIDs, I see your fire rates. Um, but at the end of the day, if, again, 2.4 is a legacy network, it's very challenging um, because of like only three non-overlapping channels. When you go into 5 gigahertz, you know, it gives you a, a, a many more uh, a robust channel selection, right? You have Uni1, Uni2, Uni2 Extended, Uni3. Um, we don't subscribe to anything past channel bonding 40. In fact, many of our APs on the hospital floor today are at 20 mm -hmm. because our, cow our cows don't need to have 40 megahertz bandwidth. And we didn't want to chew up all those extra channels. So in areas where we have higher density, cafes, cafeterias, auditoriums, mm -hmm. conference rooms, we do do 40 megahertz. Um, but it's very challenging if you have neighbors that are – competing with you on the same channel, um, you may need to, or maybe even have RRM, enact channel change. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now, um, there, there is a chart or recommendation of how many bases per uh, access point. I know that there is like a, a question that very commonly is, is asked, how many devices per access point. What is the best way to, to calculate that? Because it will vary by the models, it will vary by the density and the how many, you know, um, how many devices are supported by, by by that specific AP. But what is what is uh, your best approach? Well, I think it all comes down to what are the applications. What is the 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 applications being used on the access point? 
let me give you some real world examples. In our all wireless office, there are times when we have um, meetings there and you have a lot more people than the 300, 300 folks that typically show up. And we'll see some access points that might have 50 or 60 people on them. It sounds crazy, right? It sounds like it's an overla overloaded access point. But believe it or not, it's at very low utilization. Because these folks may be just doing web surfing, they're just checking email. Um, so it's really you need to understand what are your design requirements, who are your users, and what are they going to be using. You know, voice packets are very small, very small in comparison to, let's say, if you do a YouTube video, or even like this WebEx that we're on. So, you know, those packets are very small, and they need to be it on the network in a timely fashion. But now if all of a sudden you have 60 users trying to do YouTube, well, you've got a bigger problem now, mm -hmm. right? In many office environments, not everyone's doing YouTube and Netflix. It's just typical burst traffic. So in those cases, understanding those applications, you know, you might want to come up with a happy medium of 25 to 30 clients per EP. But I can tell you, in some of the testing that we've done, we've had upwards of 60 or more clients on an access point and not seen any problems, only because the users aren't necessarily using high bandwidth applications. Okay. And they are typically looking specifically on the 3700. Is there any specific about the 3700 that they need to take into account? or? Well, I mean, the, the Cisco 3700 is uh, uh, the second model in the Cisco family of 11AC. The, the model previous to that was a Cisco 3600 with a module. Um, um, it is our access point of choice. Um, we have uh, probably about 4,000 of those deployed. Um, we just did a deployment uh, of our last box, if you will, um, a number of weeks ago. Um, so you know, we've been very happy with the, the 3700, and we've been beta testers on the 3800 as well, and having the uh, microcell and two 5 gigahertz software-defined radio. Um, so we're, we're excited and, and looking to, uh, to use the 3800 in some of our, our newer construction areas. Perfect. And talking about that, uh, on the, uh, the data rates for uh, 5 gigahertz channel, what do you have that data? Oh, I see Carlos already is answering that. So let, let me jump into another one. Um, <laughs> He's good, Carlos. He's good. I'm telling yeah. you. So uh, could uh, could you explain your sniffing setup with Wireshack using separate APs? Uh, so right. So with our sniffer access points, we use OmniPeak in the back. Um, before it was actually even released, OmniPeak had what they call the OmniPeak uh, wireless appliance. Um, for Folks that have used OmniPeak, it's uh, one of the go-to uh, sniffing tools for detailed analysis. And we have that in our data center. And when you configure a Cisco access point, you have the ability to configure it in different types of modes. One of those modes um, is sniffer. And in sniffer mode, what you do is you reboot the access point in sniffer mode, you put the IP address of the OmniPeak appliance, and you set a channel. And what it does is it effectively sits on the network and it's just analyzing that channel. And it's sending all the data, all the over-the-air data, back to the OmniPeak appliance. Now, the OmniPeak appliance isn't just doing it for that access point, but we could do it for multiple access points. Because here's the big problem. You have an issue, and Dr. Chan said, hey, he disconnected, but he disconnected three hours ago. Well, the event already happened. So some things that we do for troubleshooting is that we're able to go through the Windows logs. Believe it or not, there's event, Windows log event codes that you can go back and look at how the driver or supplicant reacted at that time four hours ago that Dr. John had an issue. But again, when you're troubleshooting a wireless network, you look at three pieces. You look at the device and everything you can collect off it. You look at the infrastructure and everything you can collect off it, debugs, whatever. And then you look at over-the-air captures. Over-the-air captures is my lie detector, really. So the OmniPeak appliance acts as my lie detector by having access points in a sniffer mode. Yeah. And um, this is the last question because then we are about to wrap up here. What is your AP cell side? Uh, the, the cell size is the AP. What is the coverage area? Do you use, do you use any RTLS? Right. So um, we are we, at the Greater Enterprise. We are an RTLS shop. We have access points at the edge. Um, we typically design five gigahertz at twelve and a half milliwatt. Um, that gives us the ability to fluctuate the power up as well as down a little if we need to. Um, we try to design to the lowest common denominator. And in all of the testing that we've done on clients, uh, typically your iPhone 
is the lowest common denominator, right? Your iPhone doesn't have necessarily the receive sensitivity as some more of the purposely designed wireless devices. So, for example, like a, a Cisco phone that hears the network extremely well. Um, so we try to design to those lower common uh, receive devices. Um, so our cell sizes are small. We try to subscribe to putting access points in rooms, not necessarily hallway design. You do place all APs in a hall for transition, um, but we try to use access points and create small cells or, you know, in rooms. Perfect. Well, thank you, George. This concludes the Q&A portion of today's event. Uh, George will be uh, entertaining more questions on this uh, link here. If you have more questions, please feel free to uh, ask those on, uh, until the 24th of February. Uh, we have a whole suite of social media channels, so we invite you to participate and become fans from Facebook to all the way to Instagram. So. Uh, the links are in the chat if you are interested to becoming a fan. We we provide a lot of information on those channels, like including uh, you know the recording of the session on the YouTube, etc. We also have uh, the community in five different other non-English uh, languages. So if you speak any of these languages listed here, uh, you are welcome to participate on the community in any of those languages. Uh, we we need more experts on those those areas. So if you are a wireless expert. Feel free to come and answer some of the questions in this. You can also learn more information about uh, on IT and technical training. Uh, you can view the upcoming sessions on, on the link on the chat. Uh, so feel free to use those because they also have uh, great information out there. Uh, if uh, this is a perk for for everybody that attended the the event today, if you go to the link uh, that is on this slide and is going to be put on the chat. Uh, with the code of CSC, you will be able to get a 35% discount on the Cisco Press book uh, that you select. So uh, take, uh, this is a great opportunity for you to get some uh, some discounts on, on Cisco Press books. And this is only available to the people that attended this event. And last but not least, uh, just make sure to take a moment to fill out the survey so that, that the we know what, what are your thoughts, and we also know what are the other topics you want us to. And before signing off, I would really like to uh, thank George Stefanik. It was an excellent uh, work. And also Carlos and Edgar for helping with answering all these questions. Remember that we are going to have like a live, uh, like a Q&A document with all the questions that were asked, and then you can continue to ask your questions on the ASCII Expert event that opened today. This concludes the session today, and thank you. Thank you very much.